uh, great to be here at GoTo. And uh, you know, today, I want to talk to you about AI. Um, before I jump into that, maybe a little background. Uh, I, I've been at Google the last couple years in the CTO office. I joined Google even though most of my career I've been an entrepreneur just because um, the pace of innovation in AI has moved so fast, and I feel like it's having such a big impact on society that I wanted to be part of the company that was really uh, leading the way in terms of innovation and research and applications of AI. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those applications, but I'm also going to talk about um, today about how it's affecting uh, our world, right, and, and why it's so important to be responsible and what you as leaders can do uh, maybe to think about ways to really drive responsibility in AI. Um, I enjoyed Christina's talk on China, um, and uh, I think you know, she touched on some points. I actually am not going to go into a lot of depth in the sense that um, one of the disturbing trends is the rise of authoritarian states applying AI for, for things that don't align at all with our values, right? And, and there's not much I'm going to tell you about that here because uh, I, don't think, I think we'll have a violent agreement that we don't like these kinds of applications. But we also need to think about in our own countries, you know, what is, what is good in our own organizations, how to apply it effectively. So I'm going to start with the assumption of good intent of people that, that value freedom and want to apply AI for good things and, and, and go from there. So I'm going to start with a quick overview of, of some of why AI is, is having such a big impact, how it's moving quickly and, and having a positive impact. Because um, like, like all powerful technologies, it can be used for great things as well as for problematic things. But I'm going to talk about some of the problems, talk a little bit about what, what I see and what, what we're doing at Google, how we're learning about responsibility and what you can think about in your organizations around responsibility, and, and then draw a few conclusions. So with that in mind, let's start with the promise of AI. You know, at the start of this decade, um, before the, the latest techniques, deep learning techniques, were really computationally feasible, uh, this is the kind of accuracy you could get from computer vision models. Common Task ImageNet was a, a uh, contest put together by academics. And older techniques had about a 25% error rate. Now, identifying what object you're looking at in a picture isn't trivial. You know, identifying among multiple breeds of dogs, for example, isn't a simple task. So people make about a 5% error rate. But in just five years, using these rapid advances in deep learning, we got to a point where computers were achieving superhuman results, about a 3% error rate. So rapid advance indeed, right? And that's not isolated. It wasn't just in vision. Um, we saw a similar thing around language models. So we just wrote a blog post for Google AI about using uh, the latest research in deep learning, BERT models, to be the, the biggest improvement in Google search in the last five years. And as in this example, um, they, they have a better ability to understand the meaning of what the user is asking. It's not just a bag of keywords, right? So in, in the example here that's maybe a little hard to see, when you're asking about needing a visa, instead of finding an, a news article about what's going on with visas, you find a link to how you could actually go and apply for a visa that is a better capture of the intent of what you're after. And this turns out to be important because um, people are increasingly asking Google Search to, to answer things, to, to get helpful answers um, in a more natural way. And one in every, every six searches that's done at Google, roughly, has never been seen before. So we don't have a lot of statistics on what a person might be looking for. So being able to break down those queries in, into what they mean is really valuable, right? So that's one area where we're applying AI in our products. You know, another one, um, who here uses Gmail? All right, so you've probably seen this feature where um, it, it will help complete sentences for you and, and make useful suggestions. I find it saves a lot of time when I'm sending emails. Um, an irony here, an example of how fast things are moving. It was about 10 years ago, we had an April Fool's joke about e Gmail answering your email for you, and now it's shipping. So not completely, but, but definitely helping. Um, but, but you know, in more serious things, not just you know, great digital products that are helpful in everyday lives, but take a look in, in the domain of health. One example, uh, diabetic ret retinopathy um, caused by diabetes. It's one of the um, fastest growing causes of blindness. Um, and, uh, you know, there's over 400 million people worldwide who have diabetes. Boy, that's annoying, that, so, that icon. Sorry about that. Let's, let's quit that. Um, and uh, as you can see, there, it affects people around the world. Um, large numbers of people and growing in, um, in South, Southern Asia and, and, and Eastern Asia in particular, Western Pacific. So there's a lot of people affected by this. 
in many third world countries, there's a significant shortage of doctors, and almost half of uh, victims of this suffer eye loss before diagnosis because it's hard to get to a clinic, hard to get to a doctor. Um, so applying the similar kind of vision techniques, we've been able to come up with uh, a screening algorithm that's gone through clinical trials that's actually better than, than human experts, ophthalmologists, which can make a big difference so someone can use a smartphone in a rural neighborhood in India and go and realize that they're at risk and get treated, right? So it was an example of how AI can have a big impact. You know, we're also using it to create a whole variety of applications and using it for other important things like modeling uh, the science for, to, to help with climate change, right? So there's a lot of really good applications of AI. So, so with that in, in, in mind, I, I, I want to start with that because I think it's having a tremendous positive impact and will have a tremendous positive impact. Um, I don't want you to walk away from this like, well, we should just stop this AI thing because it's bad. Far from it. But I do think it's important to understand where we're having problems arise from this. And, and you know, if you think about it, there's problems around bias. There's cases where people don't have enough controls in place. There's places where it's having unexpected impact on society. And, and where you know, we're having a negative impact on our users of applications. So let's, let's touch on a few examples of these. There's a couple times of, types of bias. One is unfair, unequal performance for different classes. The other is representational harms. Uh, we'll look at examples of each of those. So disparate performance. This is a system, this is an example from a system compass that's used to decide which criminals uh, should get parole, which ones are likely to re-offend. Re Right, and in this example, uh, Vernon is a white male with pretty serious back, uh, prior offenses, but the system judged him to be low risk, and he went out and committed another serious crime. Uh, Brescia is a black female with what appears to me to be relatively minor offenses, um, was judged to be high risk by the system, and did not subsequently reoffend. And those, those examples are, in fact, all too typical, that you see that the system disproportionately labels uh, blacks as high risk who don't go on to reoffend, and whites as low risk who do go on to reoffend. Right, so a pretty clear case of uh, disproportionate performance, and in a case where a pretty high stakes decision is being made. Right, a decision of whether someone can get out on parole has a pretty big impact on their life. Um, another example: this is a recent study from UC Berkeley uh, showing how. Um, in fintech, uh, with, with fintech models, which don't explicitly include race anywhere, there's nonetheless uh, racial discrimination going on that uh, uh, African American and Hispanic uh, applicants are paying uh, eight basis points higher interest rates on new loans and three and a half higher on ref refis, which is, uh, amounts to $750 million a year in extra interest paid uh, due to discrimination. Right? Also another example of how uh, racial bias can have a big impact. Right, so th those are a couple examples. Here's one that's representational harms. Um, a first version of a model that um, this Jigsaw made. Jigsaw is a part of the Google parent company Alphabet. Um, this is, it's, it, they focus on promoting healthy conversations online. And so they have a tool to help people moderate to identify toxic comments, you know, threatening, offensive, et cetera. Unfortunately, certain minority groups are often used as, an off, uh, as a negative term, right? So training off of simple examples of, of negative toxic language, the model learns, unfortunately, it, it, it comes up with a, a, a offensive representational harm that a number of minority groups, like in the example, are toxic, right? It, it judges that statement to be a toxic one. Um, so, in fact, uh, we went on to do a lot of work on how do you work through the system in terms of the training data, in terms of collecting new data, in terms of explicitly teaching the model to, to not be biased, in terms of how do you generalize from specific terms to general identity tokens to create, uh, to create a much less biased model um, with similar accuracy. But you know, in this example, you can see that th this was an example of that kind of harm. Another kind of problem that can happen from a lack of control um, Back in 2016, Microsoft had this idea to put a chatbot out on the internet and let people train it by interacting over Twitter. Um, let's say that back in 2016, I think there was a, a more naive view about uh, the nature of conversation on the internet. Let's be charitable about that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the uh, adversarial attacks, uh, you know, racists went and, and quickly taught this bot to become uh, really offensive. 
um, bad enough that I wasn't allowed to show you any examples of what it said. Uh, so you can go find them yourself if you're curious. But, you know, needless to say, it was taken down quickly, uh, right, but created, you know, neg negative interactions and a good reminder of how with insufficient controls, um, allowing a system to learn, uh, you know, in the wild can create negative effects. You know, it's, Somewhat similar way, if you think about societal impacts from machine learning algorithms, recommendation engines, um, advertising algorithms, um, you know, the, the uh, bad actors in the case of Cambridge Analytica were able to exploit these across a number of online platforms, in fact, breaking the law in the UK and violating elections law, as well as uh, influencing elections, uh, enabling, uh, enabling that in a way that's, uh, that's troubling, right? And so, that's, there's more to that story than just machine learning, right? And there's a number of actors, but there is, it's had an impact and it's a, a real concern, of course. Uh, likewise, the rise of vaccine hesitancy, which is now one of the top 10 threats to global health as of this year, according to the World Health Organization. Again, being caused in many parts by online uh, filter bubbles, by sharing, by, by the tendency of algorithms to promote uh, extreme content. Um, so again, unintended consequences harming our society. In a similar way, recent article last month's Wall Street Journal addressed how uh, Amazon had uh, changed their search algorithm to now uh, promote products that are profitable to them instead of what the user was looking for, what the customer was looking for. And, and in that article, I think a couple of interesting points are one, that the search team that was responsible felt that this was a fundamental violation of their principle to do the right thing by the user. So they felt it was harming the user and deceptive. However, it was also observed in the article that this pressure to start changing the way the algorithm worked happened right after, the, after a reorganization happened where that search team now reported to the retail team that had as its primary objective driving profitability, right? And I, and I think that's something that's important as a, a teaching moment um, and for, for all of us as leaders is you know, th creating that kind of a conflict of interest where uh, where a team is being measured on an outcome um, will put a lot of pressure to do the wrong thing, right? So if you say, hey, we value our users, we put our users first, but we're going to measure you on profitability, you know, a lot of times uh, bad things happen. In fact, in the article even talks about the lawyers, uh, the, the lawyers said, well, you can't explicitly optimize for profitability. That's going to be a problem. But you just put up a metric, and we'll just judge the, the improvements we're making based on that metric, and guess what? It achieved the same outcome, right? So, so that's problematic too, right? You know, in, in that case, being deceptive and, in some sense, manipulating users. Um, and you know, I think we all recognize that advertising is designed to get people to to be exposed by something. But you know, we've we've traditionally had a clear separation between what is advertising content and what is organic content, right? Just like nobody wants to see a newspaper publish a a, a sponsored piece, but it isn't at, labeled as advertising, it's promoted as editorial content, right? We, having that separation so at least people are clear has been a standard that we, we've held, right? So I think that's, that's an important example too, where we, we got the governance wrong, in fact, and they, you know, allegedly Amazon got the governance wrong and produced this outcome. And broadly, um, in, addition to, in addition to those kinds of situations where conflicts of interest can arise and drive people to bad behavior, a lot of this also comes about from unintended consequences. It can be hard to predict what's going to happen to machine learning models. It's important to remember that they're not hand-engineered. People aren't explicitly making the decisions. They're trained from data. So it's not obvious how they're going to work, and it's easy to have things occur that you didn't anticipate. Um, you know, a lot of times there's feedback loops in the system and how people start to interact or you know, adversaries start to behave uh, in a system can create problems, so it, it can be complicated. It could take long times, even years, for some of these consequences to manifest, right? So, so with that in mind, how can we become more responsible? How can we address this, right? I think, I think at, at the, the top is the need to have principles, to, to, to understand what you stand for and to, to, to live by them, to put the right governance structures in place so that there's teeth around those principles is important. You know, I think as leaders in, in any organization, it's well worth thinking if you have a GRC function, governance, risk, and compliance, thinking about how you can include AI responsibility as part of that. Um, and e even if you're not convinced that it's the right thing to do, um, it's probably worth thinking about how consumer attitudes are shifting rapidly on this, and indeed government legislation is moving quickly too.
Um, in particular in the EU, it's worth noting that uh, the incoming president-elect of the EU has promised to table legislation further regulating AI systems and how they operate within the first 100 days of her term, right? So, you know, the, the, there's a lot of reasons to get ahead of this. Um, underneath that, I think bringing in a broader, broadening participation with more diverse perspectives and different backgrounds is important. Allowing for better understanding of what machine learning models are actually doing is important. So is thinking about having more than one model, the way they work together. And in fact, that's an important thing um, to take away is that it's, it's almost never that computer applications and systems have a single machine learning model. In almost all cases, when your machine learning is being applied, there's a number of smaller models that are working together in concert, along with a lot of glue that's both processing data and integrating it into applications, right? So it's important to think about the system and not zoom too much into one, one particular piece of it, one algorithm. And then finally, thinking about how you can align the objectives of the system with your values. So let's touch on these briefly. These are principles that we've articulated at Google. Um, there are others. It's one of the good things. Like we published these last year, and, and in the last year, we've seen other large companies publish out principles. We've seen third parties, think tanks. We've seen the EU publish out uh, guidelines for trustworthy AI. Right. So some of the, the highlights here are things like being socially beneficial, not create or reinforce unfair bias, being safe, accountable to people, uh, privacy baked in, high standards of scientific excellence, and being used for for applications that accord with these principles. Now, in particular, there's some things that at Google we've decided not to pursue, uh, which isn't to say necessarily that no one would pursue them, um, but, but certainly, um, you know, the idea of, like, we're, we've decided we're not going to do things to create weapons with AI, nor do we want to get engaged in surveillance that violates international norms, right? So um, others... Uh, you know, there, there may be others who would debate some of those. Um, it's not a claim of universality, but it's certainly a clarity around what we will do and what we value at Google. Um, another set of values we published, I think, also really tie into this because one of the most fundamental uh, values of Google is respect the user. And to me, what flows from that, the, the notion of digital well-being is something that we've really embraced in the last few years as an important notion. That's part of respecting the user, right? And you can see how... This, this also weighs on how to think about machine learning, right? So giving users awareness of what's going on, encouraging mindful use, enabling control, right? What does control mean? Well, in a lot of cases, control means giving people more ability to influence the way a machine learning algorithm acts, right? So algorithms that just kind of lead people into doing something and, and become really, um, say, tempting, you want to give people ability to step back and say, how do, what do I want? What's, a, what's my longer-term set of goals, right? Um, that, that leads to the next one, which is how do you avoid that regret, right? You, you don't want to build applications where it's like, the recommendations were so good, but now I'm going to bed at 3 a.m. because I've been up too late you know, reading content, watching videos, right? How can I let, have some, make it easier for people to, to keep control and to get what they want and, and to feel good about the time they're spending? Um, in an application or experience, right? And that, that part of that is then, of course, user trust, being straightforward and, and clear about what's going on uh, in an intentional way, right? So I think design is important here, but so is how you think about the machine learning systems you build, right? To establish effective governance, is a big thing we, we do at Google, we, we've, we've put together um, a process uh, with authority to review um, potentially uh, high stakes or, or important AI applications to say, do they comply with our principles? And do we need to, to put some guardrails or modifications around how things will roll out or even stop them, right? So we have review committees and we have a process. And indeed, you know, I think you have to have a review process in order to have teeth, which is multidisciplinary, right? It's not just engineers, but it's policy experts, it's legal, it's privacy um, as well, right? As well as having process and ability, right? So, so that's one side of governance. Just as important in my mind, as I said before, is really thinking about how to set things up so you have the right incentives for people um, to try to avoid conflicts of interest. Right? I think a, a counterexample, the way Google separates the search product area from the ads product area, so the search product team is not evaluated based on ad revenue is really important. It's also worth bearing in mind, super important to, to remember that People are central to how machine learning works, even though it's a technology. 
no technology is value neutral, right? They're fundamentally being implemented by people and there's lots of control points. We're picking the data sources, we're deciding what to evaluate them on, and we get affected by the results, right? So it's very much, there's a values discussion, and I think all too often, because it's new technology, people aren't always familiar, there's a tendency to shy away and say, well, the engineers are gonna handle that. But, but that's a cop-out. We have to always be thinking about what are the consequences and make sure that we actually understand and ask the questions. And if the answers aren't clear, don't, don't walk away, but insist on clarity, right? It, it, it's too important to simply say, we're just going to let that be a technical detail that I don't, I don't understand. It has to be brought up. Part of that is like, how do you get the right kind of model understanding, right? There's a lot of research around model understanding, a lot of visual tools and lower level research around understanding complex neural networks, right? But there are different needs for different audiences, right? So engineers typically want to debug and understand and improve algorithms as well as address problems like bias or uh, errors in the model. But domain experts, business leaders need to have a different set of needs, right? They need to have trust. They need to under have higher level transparency about what's going on, what the impact is, how things are working for different populations, um, as well as you know, another key thing is, of course, having clear metrics, right? So it's important to, to say, you know, this is an evolving field, but what are the techniques we can use to get clear understanding of what's going on in our models? Um, this is an example of, of model interpretation. This is research integrated gradients that we did at Google that's become a popular technique for understanding. In this case, it's trying to say, why does the machine learning model think that that's a picture of a fireboat and it highlights the pixels in the, the image that led it to that conclusion, right? So ways of visualizing and making that helpful. Um, we've also done things like come up with data cards to document data so anyone can review and say, what data was used in this and does this make sense? And model cards, documentation of the machine learning models. Again, for broader audience to have a sort of standard way of understanding the machine learning model and think about how it might be relevant or what the risks might be. So I think this is interesting research, this notion of, um, where you've got high stakes decisions, try to f pick models that are simpler, that are easier to explain, rather than complicated models, right? So it's worth pushing back. The right answer isn't always the most complex model. You really do have to trade off understandability for performance of model. Um, in the paper, they have an interesting example of that recidivism system that was biased. Turned out that there's a, a simpler one based on just a handful of rules that performs almost as well and it's clearly understandable, right? So favorable. The diagram here on the left shows how uh, these research projects around model interpretation are not always so helpful or, or intuitive. Um, the system gets it wrong and thinks that dog is a cat, and the explanation is highlighted, right? The hotter pixels are more of the reason why it's what it's looking at, which doesn't really help us understand why the model isn't working, right? Sometimes it, you can, but, but it, you know, it, it's not perfect, right? So uh, where you can, having simpler models is really preferable. You know, another important thing then is having multiple metrics, both in simulation before you release the system, but then when you do live tests. I mean, hopefully you're doing at least A-B tests or various forms of bandits to have multiple versions of models live and comparing them. But don't just compare on one thing. Don't just compare on, hey, the thing I'm optimizing, right? Also look at what are secondary metrics? Is user sentiment changing? What's churn looking like? What feedback are you getting? How is time spent varying? Like, look at a variety of relevant metrics to, to get a better insight into what's happening and see, like, are there problem areas? You can slice them too, right? Slice them by subpopulations and see, is there a problem in some area? That's good to know, right? Another thing that, that ha comes up is come up with secondary models, ways of detecting things. Like, um, this is an example uh, of a conspiracy theory video. Um, it turns out if you find it on YouTube, um, it's now much harder to find them. We've done a lot of work to to make them not, not uh, so prominent in searches and recommendations. But if you do, you know, we'll put up a little disclaimer that links you to the facts about the moon landing um, when you're watching a video that's questioning it. Um, so that's an example of a secondary model, right? And there's a lot of these, like identifying toxic, toxic comments or, or sensitive information. So, so there's a role for that. But I don't think it's a substitute for saying, how do we build more sophisticated objective functions, loss functions on our machine learning systems? Can we come up with better ways? Like, there, we're always doing some approximation. We're optimizing for something that's not exactly what we want in the real world, but we have to have the computer do something that we can measure, right? But 
But increasingly, we need to be thinking about more complex blended functions that are better representations of what we're really after, and always be thinking about what are the consequences, what are, what are the potential risks, right? So classic example, if, if you optimize for clicks, you get a lot of clickbait, stuff that people click on and then don't like, right? So then we, a lot of people want to, well, let's optimize for time spent. The problem with that is that can also lead to user regret, right? So Harder to say, but how would you optimize, for example, for time well spent? How do you really get a proxy for what is, is good time that users feel like is, is, is healthy, right? So we've also published out a variety of responsible AI practices, including you know, how to integrate into human-centered human design. Um, I'll, I'll show you a link um, to these, since we don't have time to cover all of this. More, probably more useful for technical teams. But in conclusion, you know, I think a couple of things. One is, um, in some sense, we've been here before, right? With any powerful new technology, there's a, a, a need for responsibility, right? So when automobiles came out, they were powerful and had a potentially big impact. But um, it took some time, right? It took unsafe at any speed, Ralph Nader, to, to make us realize that there was a, an opportunity to do a lot more with safety in automobiles. And then subsequent EPA guidelines to drive to increased awareness of environmental impact um, that led us to uh, improvements so I think in a similar way, we can see that uh, we're on a journey with AI. Um, I couldn't resist the, uh, we had an artist at my version of this talk for engineers this morning who drew those nice pictures. So I thought it'd be fun to include them in the, the recap slide. Right, so I think the four key things is one, it's, it's key as leaders to be taking responsibility and think about the implications and risks when we're applying machine learning, especially because it's more complex and not as well understood. Um, broaden participation uh, in projects that are using machine learning. You know, have more transparency in review and monitoring of them to see what's going on and empower all the stakeholders. And make sure that you're really aligning your values into the outcomes of the system. And so with that, let me close with uh, some QR codes with resources. Both we have a people and AI guidebook that we've published. The EU has published ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. And then we have responsible AI practices. So those are some resources you might find helpful. And, and with that, we might have time here at the end for uh, a question.